Edward Jenner designed his garden as a refuge where he could retreat from his work and delight in the natural world. Some two centuries later, it remains very much as Jenner would have known it, a peaceful haven in the heart of Berkeley. From the vinery and sweeping lawn to the woodland area with its decaying tree stumps and rustic summer house, Dr. Jenner's garden is a rare survival of a small town garden in the picturesque style. But it wasn't always this way. Earlier occupants of the Chantry would have delighted in a much more formal layout, as this 1712 engraving of Berkeley Castle shows. Sometime after Jenner purchased the property in 1785, he recruited his friend Robert Ferryman to create a garden that was intended to challenge the ideas of those such as Capability Brown, whose landscapes were seen as far too idealised. Those like Jenner and Ferryman, whose interest lay in the picturesque style, sought to retain natural features such as old tree stumps and ancient paths. Jenner had a lifelong fascination with gardens and horticulture. Long before his work on vaccination, on 5th of June 1787, he wrote to the renowned naturalist and botanist Joseph Banks with an account of various experiments involving the use of human blood as a fertiliser. Jenner described how a small quantity of the serum of human blood was poured over about a square foot of grass on a grass plot. Three sprinklings were given at the distance of a fortnight each, and the whole of the quantity applied was the serum contained in 40 ounces of blood. Later he commented, the effects it has produced on the vegetation of the grass is astonishing. It is beautifully green and thick and has sprung up several inches while the surrounding grass has just begun to shoot and looks of a yellowish green. Buoyed by this success, Jenner went on to test more plants with blood and animal matter. In one, he planted four currant trees in varying mixtures of blood and compost. Here the blood fertiliser was less effective and the plants that had been exposed to the most serum soon died. Of his experiments, Jenner concluded, but though they do not go far enough to determine whether animal manure will produce lasting good effects on vegetables, they prove that a superabundance of this substance is destructive to vegetable life. Upon arriving at the Chantry, one of Jenner's first priorities may well have been to establish a herb garden. Like most medics of his time, Jenner would have used herbs as part of his daily treatment of patients. And our physic garden shows just some of the plants he may well have used. Meadowsweet, lungwort, heartsease, ladies mantle and speedwell sit alongside more commonly known ones such as thyme, marjoram, chives and rosemary. Jenner also invested a huge amount of time in developing a productive garden to feed his household and he particularly enjoyed unusual plants, trading transparent apples and white strawberries with his friends. His letters regularly contain news of his latest horticultural successes, such as a gooseberry weighing five drachms. Jenner's pride and joy were the vines, black Hamburg grapes planted here in June 1817 as cuttings from the great vine at Hampton Court Palace. The bed in the centre of the vinery would have been filled with leaf mould and damp oak bark chippings, which would cause the bed to reach temperatures of up to 30 degrees Celsius and help more exotic plants to grow. The vines are another rare survival, still producing fruit today. Alongside rustic features such as an irregular primrose tump and an agreeable lawn, Jenner's garden would have been full of all manner of unusual species, many collected by ferrymen. Jenner's letters talk of a promise of garden seeds from the south of Spain and from Genoa. 
A highlight of late summer and autumn are our cyclamen, which were planted here by a later resident of the Chantry, Harriet Stackhouse, who in the late 1800s went on a trip to the Vatican. There, in the papal gardens, she spied some particularly attractive specimens and secreted a few corms in her umbrella, right under the nose of the Swiss Guard. At this time of the year, the same area in the shadow of the 200-year-old plane tree is home to the remnants of pungent wild garlic. A friend of Jenna described how the garden was inhabited by fowls and half-domestic pheasants, which are never killed for the table, but preserved to give a constant bustle of animation to the still life of wood, when not gracefully waving with the vernal zephyr. Now we try to make sure our garden is attractive to a wide range of animals, although we haven't yet persuaded any pheasants to come and stay. Even a natural garden requires a significant amount of care and attention. And like Jenna, we know that it takes teamwork to keep it looking this wonderful. Our garden team are all volunteers and over the past couple of years, they've worked hard to restore the garden and reintroduce traditional planting, including designing and building the Physic Garden themselves. We all hope to be back in Dr Jenna's garden soon.